what is the subject of this talk? It's what now? What do we do after the election? How can you protect your assets and how can you take steps to, to be sure that your child with special needs especially is, is protected? Because there have been some major changes in law that really affect everyone. Um, and, and we want to make sure that you're aware of what just happened and what you might do going forward with your plan. Um, so just want to take a moment to introduce your, myself. Um, I'm Mark Gilfix. I'm an attorney. I'm a partner here at Gilfix and Paul Associates. We're based in Palo Alto. I'm also a proud member of the Pacific Autism Center for Education Board. So I want to thank Pace for helping to put this together, getting the word out for this webinar. Um, you can see my hair is a little bit crazy. I've been taking COVID very seriously and have not had a professional haircut in a very long time. It's probably pretty obvious as you look at me right now. Um, so feel free to make fun of me if you'd like. Um, today, my hair is behaving more than it often does. So I don't know if those of you out there can relate to this. If you've been giving yourself haircuts, if you have any tips for at-home haircuts, I just learned that George Clooney has used a Floby for years to cut his own hair. He's given himself haircuts for years. So maybe I should become like George Clooney and just try to cut my own hair. Um, anyway, um, on a more important note, we're going to cover some key issues related to estate planning and special needs planning. I know many of you here um, are involved with the Pacific Autism Center for Education. Uh, maybe you have a child or a loved one on the autism spectrum. This applies really to all families, but especially if you have a child um, on the spectrum for whom you want to make sure your house is available. So we're talk about a few different issues. I'm not going to spend much time on those. I'm really going to focus um, on Prop 19 and what you need to know about it as we look to the future. So I will go back to sharing uh, my presentation here. Again, I want to thank the Pacific Autism Center for Education for helping to spread the word about this talk. Um, I'm, I'm very proud of my affiliation with PACE, and I'm, I'm very glad to connect with the, this wonderful community. So as we get started, I want you to take a moment just to think about what drove you to join us here or really me. Um, are you worried about your finances? Are you worried about your, your family's future? Are you worried about the implications of that little election that we had just a few weeks ago, just over a month ago? Um, do you just feel overwhelmed? Um, these are, needless to say, extraordinarily challenging times. So much going on. And I don't mean to throw just another monkey wrench in 2020, but I have to. But I'm also going to tell you how you can deal with a couple of the issues that just came up. And just you know, about what our firm, Gilfix and the Poll does, we've been doing this type of planning for over 38 years. Um, our firm was one of the first in the state of California to do special needs trusts. This is a big part of what we do and we're here to offer you solutions. Whether you work with us or not, I hope you get a lot out of this talk and, and just that it reiterates some of the things you need to know. Maybe you don't know about some of these, these subjects. If you don't, this is great. If you already know these, this will be a great refresher. Um, and I truly believe that we go over the next 60 minutes, maybe a little bit less, um, could change your family's future. These are high stakes issues. And I know it's hard to wrap your head around some of these concepts and some of these steps, but I truly believe that, that this can be life-changing, especially if you have a child you know, on the autism spectrum who you feel like you need to support after you're gone. And just imagine what's possible for your children, your grandchildren, when you, when you really put a comprehensive plan together when you think about this holistically and when you take steps ahead of time to protect your hard-earned assets. So what are we gonna talk about today? Um, why, if you have a living trust, it's important to review it. And if, why, if you don't, you definitely need a living trust. Um, you also need a special needs trust if you have a child um, with special needs. I'm gonna talk briefly about the secret for protecting assets from divorce, lawsuits, and estate taxes. If you have any children who don't have special needs, there's still trust we have to create for them that can be very protective. And then really the focus is gonna be on Prop 19, the implications of the election, why there's a critical, critical deadline that we have to be aware of, February 15th, 2021, and what you need to do before then. I'm also gonna talk about the estate tax. Not an issue for many families right now, but if you own a home in California, in the Bay Area, it very much could be part of your future and something you need to be aware of. And then this is really about protecting your home and protecting your assets, what you can do as we sum this all up to protect your hard-earned assets for your children and for your grandchildren. So let's start with a topic that I think is important, your homes. Um, if you're fortunate enough to own a home in Silicon Valley, what is it worth? Um, it could be worth 2 million, it could be worth 5 million, it could be worth more. No matter what it's worth today, 
assuming history at all repeats itself, the value is likely to double every eight to 12 years. That's what's happened pretty much for the last 40 years in Silicon Valley. COVID's changed things a bit. Who knows about the future? But it's very likely that the value of our homes will continue to grow if we're fortunate enough to own homes in, in these prime areas. And I got to make this point. Your home by itself in a few years could present estate tax issues. I'll explore why that is. So even if you don't consider yourself high net worth, even if you don't think of yourself as wealthy, it's very likely you and your family could, in coming years, face estate tax exposure. And that's a really brutal tax. It's uh, it's 40% of everything you have over the estate tax limit. 40% could be lost over those, those very limited numbers. Um, and Prop 19 created a new minefield for property taxes. There used to be some pretty powerful protections for homes passed from parent to child. A lot of those are gone. So we're going to talk about that as well. And, and the key, how can you protect your home for your kids um, and, and really for your grandkids as well? Uh, but I think for many people here, it's especially important for your kids, especially if you have a child with special needs. Uh, just briefly about me, it's kind of weird for me to talk about myself. Usually I have a co-presenter who will talk about me, but just my, I think it's important you know where I came from and who I am, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I'm from Palo Alto, born and raised. I graduated from Stanford, um, un Stanford as an undergrad. It was a management science and engineering major. And after undergrad, I didn't go straight into law. I was a management consultant for many years. Um, so I worked with big corporations, the Department of Defense, big tech companies, and advising them on corporate strategy issues. Now, okay, they could reorganize. How could they become more, how could they, they, how they could become more profitable and just more effective as companies. And I think that really helps me as I think about my client situations. You know, I'm working with families. I try to think holistically. It's not just about my trust. It's about how the overall financial and estate plan fits together for every individual family situation. Um, I went to Loyola Law School in Los Angeles, went to an evening program. I was in school for four years of night classes because I was working during that time. Not something I recommend for normal humans. It was not fun, uh, but I did. I was fortunate to do very well there. And, and since I graduated, I, I try to do a lot of writing, publishing, speaking. Um, I've been fortunate enough to win a couple of awards in that area. So this is what I live and breathe. Uh, estate planning, special needs planning, tax planning, it's serving families. And it's not just high net worth families, it's families of all backgrounds. That's, that's what I'm passionate about um, in, in my day-to-day -day job, meeting with families, getting to know them, and helping them through these complicated issues in plain English. And um, you can follow me on Facebook if you want, by the way, facebook.com backslash Mark Gilfix, just my name. And I post webinars sometimes there and, and other important articles. And just about our firm, Gilfix and the Pole Associates, uh, we're proud of our heritage. It was started by my parents um, in 1982, I think it was. And we've been around in the Palo Alto area for over 38 years, serve clients throughout California. Um, especially in this day and age of Zoom, we can serve people really anywhere in the state of California. Um, and we've served thousands of families in the community, been featured in the media around the country. Uh, and our goal is really to provide incredible return on investment and value for the people that we work with. Um, and just to be clear, because for those of you who will want to work with us, it's not just me. We have a number of other attorneys, Michael Gilfix, my father. We have a whole team of estate planners, including my mom, who no longer is active, but we have a great team. We're really a family oriented firm. So that's just about us. Enough about me. We have an amazing team. Um, Nick Klingenberg, Renee Conard also meet with a lot of our clients in this area. But let's go to some of the key issues I want to cover here today. If you have questions, please submit them in the Q&A function, and I will get to them as best I can, mostly at the end of this talk. So feel free to, to submit those in the Q&A function here if you have that. Uh, now let's talk about some mysteries. Uh, a tale of supercharging a plan. Larry and Wyatt. They're both in the exact same situation. Imagine them as the same guys in alternate parallel realities. Both of them have fathers who are fortunate enough to leave $2 million for them. Larry gets this $2 million. He endures a divorce. He gets sued. When he passes away, it's all gone. Nothing's there for his kids. And of course, there's nothing there for his grandkids. Wyatt, on the other hand, same, same shoes, same divorce, same lawsuits. But when he passes away, that $2 million left for his benefit has grown to $6 million. And by the time it goes, so $6 million goes to his kids. And by the time his kids pass away, there's $18 million in, these, in, in this family for the grandchildren. It goes from $2 million to $6 million to $18 million in one reality, $2 million to zero in the other. Same circumstances overall, same types of families. What's the difference? I'm going to go over that. Very timely here. Protecting the family home. And this is really the focus of the talk here today. Let's imagine similar thing. Three parallel universes of the same situation starting out. Tom, Jill, and Amos. 
they all have $3 million residences. So they own decent houses in Silicon Valley worth $3 million. The assessed value of all for all three of them, the value that is used to calculate property taxes is $300,000. They've all owned these houses for a long time. They haven't been reassessed. So they're paying only you know, $3,000 a year in property taxes. All, unfortunately for Tom, Jill, and Amos, they all passed away in 2022. They all want to leave their house to their children. Tom, when he passes away in 2022, his daughter inherits it. She decides to rent out the house to a third party. She already has a house. She doesn't want to live there. Property taxes go from $3,000 a year to over $30,000 a year when his daughter inherits it. Jill, same situation. She passes away in 2022. Her daughter inherits it, but her daughter decides to live there. So she doesn't rent it out. Her property taxes increase from $3,000 a year to $20,000 a year, even though she's living in the family house and inherited it. Amos, on the other hand, same situation. When he passes away in 2022, it goes to his daughter. Her property taxes remain at $3,000 a year. Same situations, $3 million house with low property taxes passes to the next generation. In one situation, taxes go up to $30,000 a year, another to $20,000 a year, and another, they don't change. They stay at $3,000 a year. And property taxes are punishing because they're every year. So once it goes up, once they go up, they never go back down. And that's really, again, the focus of this talk. And I'm just going to skip ahead to one of these solutions. I'm going to dive into this more. What's the difference in Tom, Jill, and Amos? Well, Tom, he simply left it to his daughter and she didn't live there. Under Prop 19, if a parent leaves their primary residence to their child, if that child doesn't claim it as their primary residence, as their homeowner's exemption, property taxes are fully reassessed, even if it's a parent-child gift or bequest. That's a big change from what we have today. Jill, on the other hand, she left it to her daughter. Her daughter decided to live in it, made it her residence. And I think a lot of people thought that Prop 19 kept protections if a child chose to live in mom and dad's house. Wrong. It provides some protections, but it got rid of most of them. So in Jill's case, only $1 million of assessed value, assessed fair market value was protected when she made it her home. That left a bunch. It's a $3 million house. You can only protect 1 million of it. So property taxes still went up to $20,000 a year. Amos, on the other hand, took steps before February 16th, 2021. And he was able to create a plan that kept property taxes low for his daughter indefinitely, whether she lived in the house or not. And in the special needs context, special needs planning, the home is often the centerpiece. And just think about the possibility of leaving the house for a child with special needs via special needs trust, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Under current law, pre-February 16th, there were really no worries. As long as a parent-child transfer, property taxes stay low. And that's great if your child wants to live in the house or if you want to rent the house out to support them if they're living elsewhere. Going forward, we lose a lot of those protections unless we take steps before February 16th. Again, that's what I'm going to talk about. Now, let's take a step back. What is an estate plan? This is what, what we do. We help a lot of families in this world. There's a big four, four documents. Really, for, for mom and dad, it's three, but we believe basically every family also needs a fourth category. Revocable living trust, that takes the place of what you think of as a will, critical to have a trust and not just a will. Durable power of attorney for finances, this governs day-to-day -day finances. Critical that this is not just a check the box form. A lot of people do these in very simple ways, but they don't cover some critical, critical tools that you really might need later in life. So you don't want just a simple power of attorney. Advanced Healthcare Directive that governs day-to-day -day financial decision making. If if you have issues with uh, the utility company or the the Social Security office, the power of attorney um, is what covers finances. The Advanced Directive covers healthcare decisions. So if you're in the hospital, can't speak for yourself, the Advanced Directive lets you empower people who can make decisions for you and communicate on your behalf with doctors. And the last category, this is for the next generation. If you have a child on the autism spectrum or just a child with special needs, you absolutely need a special needs trust for him or her. And for other children who don't have special needs, even if they're, they're thriving, making good money, we really think you need to create a family protection trust for them. So not to overwhelm, but there's those two types of trusts that we think are required for the next generation. I get a question a lot about why a trust and not a will. You know, a will is what we classically think of as the document that determines where assets go. Um, I'll go through that. If you just create a will, let's say everything goes according to plan. The will cleanly says to my son and my daughter, son and daughter around, everything goes, you know, according to what you thought would happen. If you have a will, even if it's set up properly, 
your state's going to have to go through probate. Probate is as if the IRS and the DMV had a baby. That would be probate. So if you like that idea, you know, probate's great. It sucks. Uh, it means that your entire state has to go through the California court system. A judge has to sign off on everything. It's public. It's time consuming and take two years or more before your assets go to the next generation. And it's extraordinarily expensive. It can be three three times the cost of administering a trust. Um, it's also only effective at death. So the person you name as your executor can't help you while you're alive. So if you're incapacitated and you had a will, the will, the person you name in the will, they, they can't do anything until you're gone. So they can't help you. Um, a trust, on the other hand, is a way of sort of privatizing your estate and managing it outside of the courts. It's taking it out of the public realm. Keeps it out of the courts if it's properly funded. The costs of administering a trust are much lower. Um, the time required to get it from your estate to your beneficiaries is much less. And you get to name a backup trustee or trustees in your trust. These are people who can step in to help manage your major assets, even if you're alive, but incapacitated. And that's a big deal. Will doesn't help you in that way. So critical to have a trust, not a will. Tell your friends uh, if you have a trust. You got to take a fresh look at it. So if you don't have a living trust, you absolutely need that. Uh, you, you Just critical. If you, if you own any property, if you have over about $150,000 in total assets, you need a trust. Um, if you have one, you have to review it every few years. Um, tax laws have changed recently. You got to make sure it has the right structure. There's AB structures, non-AB. Um, there's all sorts of tax and control issues. There's capital gains tax issues, estate tax issues. You don't want one you just downloaded from NOLO or from uh, LegalZoom or whatever that is. You know, maybe the zero K is a starting point, but there are so many critical little things that if they're wrong, can undo an entire plan. It's only as strong as the weakest link in the plan. Um, you know, it's about value. It's not about finding the cheapest trust. It's about finding the best value for a trust, one that you know will work. Because you don't know if your trust is going to work for many years from the time you create it. You might work with... Um, some service that's cheap and easy to use and you give them five star ratings everything seems great but you don't actually know if it's going to work until something happens to you and that's not when you want your family to find out that it's not set up properly so take a fresh look if you have an existing attorney you work with take a fresh look with them every couple of years we of course are available to take a fresh look at your trust as well um and what can you do to protect future generations? Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I think special needs trusts are more critical in this community. But let's say you have a child who doesn't have special needs, doing really well, um, and you just want to make sure the assets you leave them are safe and, and safe for future grandkids. Family protection trusts, generically known as dynasty trusts, are must-haves. Um, why does Bernie Sanders want to get rid of these? And, and that's not a political statement. He's on record saying he doesn't think these should be allowed. Um, well, you might see why. There's a lot in the media about them. You can Google the term dynasty trusts. Our firm's version of this is the family protection trust. Why would you do that? Why would you leave assets? And this would be you have your living trust at the top, mom and dad. And it's, let's say you have a son and a daughter. Instead of leaving money to your son directly, you would create a family protection trust for your son. And maybe your daughter is on the autism spectrum. Well, you create a special needs trust for your daughter. I'll go into those in just a second. But you wouldn't leave assets directly to your kids in either case. Why would you do this family protection trust for your son? Divorce. Um, if you leave assets directly to your child and they commingle those assets with a significant other, if they get divorced, a good chunk could be lost. Two, if your child is sued, lawsuits happen all the time, car accidents, business deals, whatever. The assets you leave your child directly are fair game in a lawsuit. If it's in one of these trusts, there's a barrier that protects the assets from a lawsuit. It's hard to get to them. On the death of your children, and your grandchildren, if you leave money directly to them, all that money plus everything that they earn is part of their taxable estate. So whatever estate tax laws are in 20, 30, 40 years, that could, they could be very strict then. That means 30, 40, 50% of what you left your child could be gone in estate taxes when they pass away. If it's in one of these trusts, it's not part of your child's taxable estate. This money can grow and grow and grow untouched by estate taxes when it goes from the children to the grandchildren. Uh, really, really powerful. And you don't have to have a third party. You might think, I don't want to tie my kids' hands. I think they're responsible. I don't want to create this complicated trust. Your child can be the trustee in charge of it. So they don't have to have answer to some third party if you think they're responsible. They can be their own trustee of this trust. So really, really powerful trust. They last for over 100 years. Um, so they last for over two or three generations in California. I think a lot of people think of these as the stuff that only really rich people do. And I want to let you know, this is not just for rich people. This is for really anybody who owns a house in California, has any assets. This can be really, really valuable. We all deserve to have these protections in our families if we want them. Uh, I'll just circle back 
to that mystery. Larry and Wyatt, Larry both and Wyatt, their, their fathers both leave him $2 million. Larry, it's all gone after he gets a, in a car accident and a lawsuit, nothing left for his children, obviously nothing for his grandchildren. Wyatt, on the other hand, that $2 million, maybe just a house in Silicon Valley, goes to $6 million and then $18 million when it goes to the grandkids. Why? Larry's father left it to him directly. When he got divorced, he lost a big chunk. When he got sued, he lost the rest. Wyatt, he got his money through a family protection trust. When he got sued, protection. When he got divorced, protection. That money grew. He just owned property with it or he invested it decently in the stock market. Over time, over decades, it doubled and, and, and then some went up to $6 million. And it was there for his grandchildren, his children during their lives. They invested it decently. It was protected for them as well. Grew to 18 million untouched by estate taxes when it went to the grandchildren. So just extraordinarily powerful trusts um, that I believe every family should at least consider. Now, you know, for this community, I think this is so critical. You may have a child or a loved one on the autism spectrum or the disability. What do you do there? Critical that instead of a family protection trust or leaving it to them directly, you need to create a special needs trust. And the image of that book is something that my father and I just published. Um, it's an updated version of our special needs trust creation and management guide, very uh, creatively named. We literally just wrote a book on this subject. Um, it addresses a bunch of issues related to special needs planning, financial planning as it relates to it, certainly the legal side of it, government benefits, how it all fits together. Um, it's available for sale on our website for any of our clients, or if you become a client, we give you a copy, of course. Uh, it's a really valuable resource. We wrote it for, for families. It's not meant for attorneys. So we just published this um, and we have copies available. So it's something we think about a lot, but the key is why would you leave? Why do you need to create a special needs trust? Why is it so critical? Instead of leaving money directly to a child with special needs, if you do that, well, one, is it wise for that child to be in charge of his or her own money? And two, if they have money, they are not eligible for government benefit programs that they might otherwise be entitled to, like SSI and Medi-Cal. Um, it can be really problematic. Instead, you leave assets to a special needs trust. You structure it properly. You need to name trustees who would step in after you're gone. But by doing this, there can be a massive, uh, any size, there's no limit to how much can be in a special needs trust. And that money does not count as belonging to your child. So they don't have to report it when they're trying to become eligible for government benefit programs. Like again, SSI, Medi-Cal, you have to report your assets to them. If you have too much money in the bank, you're not eligible. You can have $3 million in a special needs trust and you can still be eligible for these programs. And that can be absolutely critical. And you can name people you trust or entities you trust, whether it's a family member, a sibling, a professional, a bank. You know, there are a lot of different options for the choice of trustee, which by the way, is really hard though. When you're thinking long into the future, if you have a younger child and you're thinking, well, who's gonna serve you know, 40 years from now? It's not an easy question. And that's something that we help our clients with a lot and something you need to think about. But critical, 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 you need to create a special needs trust for your child. And when you leave a house, whether it's to your child or for the special needs trust, same, same property tax issues apply. So when I go into Prop 19 issues, you'll see, especially if you have a child who can't earn money for him or herself, who's reliant on what you leave them, Prop 19 is especially important. So we're gonna dive into that in just a couple minutes. Um, and again, if you have questions, feel free to submit them via the Q&A function. Um, I just wanna spend one moment on your power of attorney. So critically, you set up a really good power of attorney. We give whole two-hour talks on issues related to, to mom and dad's long-term care and related issues. Um, without spending too much time on it, there are some magic words that we think you really need to have in your power of attorney that empower the people you name, if you're incapacitated, to take steps to protect your assets in case you need government benefits for long-term care. If you need to go to a nursing home, Medi-Cal can pay for the cost of nursing home care um, for most people if they're eligible for that program. There's all sorts of steps we can take to protect your hard-earned assets, especially if you have a child with a disability. There's so much we can do to protect your assets for that child and to help you become eligible for Medi-Cal. But we want to make absolutely sure that your power of attorney document is up to date and that it includes language that allows for that type of planning in case you're sick, in case you can't make decisions. So just critically, you work with someone who really knows what they're doing in this space, who specializes in elder law and long-term care, as well as special needs planning when you're developing these. We see a lot of clients who come in with sort of check the box power of, the power of attorney forms. You can almost download those. And those are fine for day-to-day -day issues, but they're not fine when it comes to protecting assets for the next generation if you encounter any complicated issues. Okay, let's transition. I know I'm going through a lot. Uh, I hope it's not too, too much here, but 
Let's talk about the election. Uh, there were two propositions our firm was paying pretty close attention to. Prop 15 would have changed taxes on commercial properties. That didn't pass, so irrelevant. Prop 19, however, passed. Massive implications for basically every homeowner in California. It, it, it's actually pretty surprising that it passed. Um, I think a lot of people didn't really understand it. Um, so I'm not here to say it's a good or a bad thing. I can certainly say that it's a bad thing for families who want to protect homes for the next generation. Um, but I'm here just, I'm just the messenger. I didn't push it and it wasn't against it. Our firm is just here to inform you and to let you know what you can do if you face these issues. So I, I hinted at this before with that, that mystery. What does Prop 19 do? Well, it un, it replaces Prop 58. So Prop 58 was a proposition that passed in the 1980s, I'm not sure what year, that allowed Californians to preserve their Prop 13 property tax benefits for the next generation. Under the old law, Prop 58, which expires February 16th, 2021, parents could pass their primary residence plus up to $1 million in assessed value property outside of the house. So rental properties and 1 million assessed that doesn't mean market value. That means Prop 13 assessed value. So you could have a building worth $10 million, but if the assessed value, because you owned it for decades under Prop 13 was only 1 million, if your property taxes were low, you could pass that $10 million property to the next generation with no change in property taxes in addition to the home. So regardless of the value of your home, regardless of what your property taxes are, under the current law that's expiring soon, you can pass it to your, as long as it's a parent-child transfer, no change in property taxes. Doesn't matter if they live there, doesn't matter if they rent it out. As long as they hold on to it, no change in property taxes. Prop 19 ends this. If there's a parent-child transfer of rental properties, full reassessment, no, no carve-outs, no questions asked. So you can't leave rental properties or commercial properties to the next generation without a, a major increase in property taxes. Those protections are gone. Now, this is where there's a lot of confusion. I think a lot of people thought, well, if I leave my house to my children, if they live there, Prop 19, I, everything I read said it's protected. They won't have a property tax increase. Wrong. Under Prop 19, if a parent transfers their home to their children, if nobody lives there, if they rent it out, full reassessment of property taxes. And in many cases, that can be over a 1,000% increase in property taxes. Many of our clients, that's today, I had a meeting and that's exactly what the numbers show. If their house was reassessed, it'd be a 1,000% increase. But even if your child lives there, only the first million dollars in fair market value is protected from a property tax increase. So let's say you have a house that you've had for forever. You're paying you know, $2,000 a year in property taxes and it's worth over $3 million. We have a lot of clients in that situation. They bought their house in the, the 60s and their property taxes are very low. If these people, this $3 million house, pass away and leave the house to their kids, even if the kids live there, there'd be a reassessment of over, the taxes would increase to over $20,000 a year. because so only that first million of the $3 million house value is protected from a reassessment. That leaves over 2 million that could be reassessed. So it's a big deal for anybody who owns a house in the Bay Area who's owned it for you know, more than a few years. Um, again, before February 15th, 2021, primary residence goes to children with no change in property taxes. And we can often pass a lot of other properties for the benefit of children with no change in property tax. This applies if it's to a special needs trust as well. After February 15th, 2021, starting February 16th, again, primary residents may get some protections if your child lives there, but if they don't, zero protections. And even if they have some of those protections, that still could mean property taxes going up 500%, 600%, maybe only 200%, massive increases. And property taxes go on forever. They don't go back down. Once they go up, that is that is thousands of dollars per year forever. Um, they only go up <laughs> uh, after February 15, 2021. Yeah, no protections. All um, all non-residential property, all non-primary residence property gets fully reassessed. And again, the primary residence, minimal protections, some protections, I should say. So again, let's go back into this just to expand on this a little bit more. Uh, for the residents, Tom, remember Tom, Jill, and Amos, that mystery I talked before, talked about before Tom and Jill didn't do any planning. Their kids faced massive reassessments, even in Jill's case where her daughter lived in her house. Amos, on the other hand, took steps ahead of time to plan for this. Rental properties. So just to expand on that note I made, 
Uh, a lot of our clients who are fortunate enough to have a second property, well, if they have a child um, on the autism spectrum or with special needs, they want to make sure that rental property is available to help support and sustain their child's expenses during his or her life. Right now, you could pass a pretty valuable property with no change in property taxes. After February 15, 2021, you cannot pass any rental properties for the benefit of your children without a full reassessment in property taxes. So let's give an example. Bill owns a fourplex. Its market value is $2 million, but the assessed value, because he owned it for many years, is only $200,000. So he's only paying about $2,000 a year in property taxes. Before February 15th, he could pass that to his kids. There'd be no change in property taxes. After February 15th, property taxes would be fully reassessed to over $20,000 a year. And for many rental properties, that makes them go from, they can go from being profitable and generating some income to neutral or even losing money in some cases. Um, same thing for on, so Bill, say he passes away in 2022, leaves a fourplex to his kids, full reassessment. Andre, on the other hand, he passes away in 2022, but he, his property taxes remain at $2,000 a year. Why? Because Andre took steps before this deadline. Um, so I'm beating this like a <laughs> beating this dead horse, whatever you want to say. February 15th is a deadline. You got to take some steps before then to protect your home and investment properties. Our firm has developed a few different solutions. We have uh, developed some new trusts. We've developed some different ways of looking at this. And we're working with so many families right now. We are getting a lot of interest in this, but we do have availability to meet with people who, who are interested in working with us. We have some spots in the next few weeks, but they are filling up because we have this deadline. Um, and and the, the solutions we're developing are absolutely consistent with special needs planning or special needs trust and with family protection trust. So whether it's with us or another expert, you know, get some advice. And I know some, you know, some people are talking to accountants about, about this, and, and that's fine. Accountants can give you an overview of the law, but I don't know that they know of different solutions you can take other than some fairly straightforward ones. So not to say anything bad about accountants, but it's just not their world to think about all of the solutions for this. And they can tell you what will happen and some, some fairly straightforward ways of dealing with it, but you have to take capital gains taxes into consideration, property taxes, estate taxes. You have to think holistically about this. So that's really what we're trying to do for our clients. Now, just along that note, I'm just gonna take a little bit of time to talk about the election on the federal level. And this really relates to estate taxes. So we have uh, Joe Biden as our president. We have a democratic controlled Congress and the Senate, we still don't even know. There's a runoff in Georgia in a few weeks, so we won't know until after that runoff election who controls the Senate. Because if Democrats win both of those seats, Democrats would control the Senate. So what does this mean? It's more likely than not that there'll be gridlock, and that means no changes in estate tax laws. But depending on what happens, excuse me, in Georgia, there could be a change. So we're going to keep a close eye on that. We do think that family protection trusts, that special needs trusts, all that should be unaffected by this. They should both be safe. Um, but we do have to be aware of numbers, and the numbers are fairly big. And what, what are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about the numbers that relate to the death tax, as some people would like to call it. It's actually known as the estate tax. But this is the image some people have when they think of the estate tax. While I see myself on the screen, my hair is really big. Um, so I hope you're getting joy out of my crazy, crazy hair. Um, but the death tax is something, the estate tax is what's owed if you have a larger estate, what is paid to the government before it goes to your heirs. Um, this image is kind of funny to me because I'm not sure if this means that the Grim Reaper is delivering a tax bill or if he's receiving a tax bill. So if the Grim Reaper is receiving a tax bill, that means that the Grim Reaper is like paying somebody else's taxes. So that'd be great. Uh, but that's not how the estate tax works. So just some quick facts, because there's a lot of misconceptions about the estate tax. It's a punishing 40% rate. Any part of your estate that's exposed to it, 40% is gone. It's going to the IRS. Um, and that's before it goes to your kids or to your heirs. Uh, now, it's a huge exempt. There's a huge exemption right now. The exemption refers to how much you can pass without any tax exposure, tax free. Currently, it's eleven point five eight million dollars per person. So for a couple, that's over twenty three million dollars. So you might be thinking, well, I'm not. If if you have that size of an estate, you have to be aware of this. And also, it's a good problem to have. You know, it's a problem of having a. a large sized estate um, and being in a good place. We still have to deal with it. Um, but you might think this, is, this doesn't apply to me. I, I'm not even close to that. I'll talk about why you still have to think about this. Very importantly, the receipt of an inheritance is not a taxable event. 
So if there's any taxes owed, it's paid before it goes to your heirs. The receipt of an inheritance, you don't have to pay income tax on it. You don't have to pay any inheritance tax on your side. So it's really a powerful thing because you know we have to pay 30, 40% taxes on our income, not on inheritance, um, unless the estate leaving it to us was very large and had to pay the estate tax. California has no state estate tax. Lots of states do. It's one of the few things that California doesn't nail us on, but we could have one in coming years. There have been bills introduced into committees in the assembly that didn't go anywhere, but you know, California is not in a great place financially, and it's always find the, the state's very good at finding new ways to tax all of us. So there could be a state specific estate tax in the future. Got to keep an eye on that. Um, what is the size of your estate? You know, as it pertains to the estate tax, well, it's probably larger than you think. In our experience, when we meet with clients, what, when they give us a ballpark estimate of what their net worth is, what the assets they have are, are worth, they're almost always 20% lower than what their actual net worth is. So take whatever number you think you have and add 20% to it, unless you're an engineer and you keep 15 spreadsheets about everything. We do have clients who are engineers or programmers who actually have it down to the penny. So that's a different category. But for most of us, uh, you probably have more than you think. It includes I, retirement accounts includes life insurance, death benefits. Life insurance can be an extraordinary tool in special needs planning to be sure there's enough there for your child. It includes property in another state and another country. All that's part of your taxable estate and your home. You have a two or $3 million home, that's part of your estate. And if the value grows each year, well, again, the value of your home could double every eight, 10, 12 years, or even sooner during economic booms. So your estate may not be as big as you think you need to worry about now, but it could be a lot bigger in the future just based on the value of your home. But you still might be thinking, okay, these are huge numbers. I'm not going to get close to 11 million, or I hope I do. Great. That'd be, I'll call you then, Mark. Um, not so fast. 2026 or sooner, winter is coming. So for those of you who are Game of Thrones fans, um, you'll kind of know what this means. You don't have to be a Game of Thrones fans to fan to know that winter is coming is not a good thing. In 2026, barring action from Congress before then. And again, if we have gridlock, nothing's going to happen. The exemption will decrease. The current law will sunset. And on January 1st, 2026, the exemption is going to be cut in half from about $11.58 million per person to around $6 million per person. And it could go down before then. We have these elections in runoff, the, the runoff election in Georgia coming right up. We have the 2022 midterms. We have another presidential election in 2024. I, I need at least four years to recover from this one. I don't know about you. Uh, and there could be deals struck on other budget deals that might change this, even if there is gridlock at the federal level. So we just have to think about that. Think about that $6 million number. That's not happening for six years. And I hope you, you raise, I can't see you, but raise your hand if you hope to be alive in six years. You know, I'm, I'm raising it. I can't. I, I think we'll all be around, hopefully. So we will face this lower number. And especially if you're single and you own a house in California, your house could be worth double what it is today then. It might not be, but if you look at historical trends, houses have always gone up. So my point is you have to be aware of this. There are so many tools though. If you face this in the future, without going into detail, there are so many ways we can help you and your family to protect your assets. So there, this is just a list of some of the things we can do that relate to estate tax planning optimal structure of your living trust. First, there's trust we can do to protect your home. There's trust we can do to protect other assets. There's family limited partnerships, charitable remainder trust, where you can benefit charities and get major benefits. Um, you can do a, a charitable remainder trust for PACE and, and get some major tax benefits and leave money for PACE. Irrevocable life insurance trust, where you can own life insurance and it's not part of your taxable estate. Family protection trust that I talked about. Uh, we actually have a new book out about that too. We do a lot of writing um, called Beat Estate Tax Forever, written by my father, Michael Gilfix. The new edition is coming out very shortly. Um, and that contains a lot about how this all fits together. So the point of this is not to, to worry about what you need to do, just that you need to be aware of it. And there's a lot you can do. Knowledge is power. So do I need to think about this? If my state's not $5 million or more, yes, you need to be aware of it. Maybe not this year, next year, but you need to be aware of it. Um, but Prop 19, if you have a house, you need to be aware of this and you need to at least get educated. Maybe you don't decide not to take action, but you need to take some steps um, before February 15th. So as we get towards the end of this, I'll take just a little bit of time for some questions. Um, the key here is multi-generational planning. Um, that's how our firm does things. We are big believers in multi-generational planning. We've written articles about this. We train other attorneys on this. To, to really save your assets, you need to be working with your kids, your next generation, or the trustees of, of the special needs trust you might be creating in the future. Um, 
we've helped thousands of families with these issues. We write books and articles on it. Uh, and just imagine what you can achieve um, if, you, if we all work together. And again, I talk about we wrote the books on these subjects. So these are the three books that we've written on all these issues. My father and I co-authored a book called Facing the Reality of Long-Term Care, relating to your own long-term care issues, how you can pay to cover nursing home care, assisted living facility, you need help at home. How can you do that while saving your assets for the next generation? We have our book on special needs trust, what you need to do for your child on the autism spectrum or with other special needs and estate tax planning. Um, without worrying about that, I think Prop 19 is the key thing because it relates to property taxes, it relates to capital gains taxes, and it relates to providing for your child over the long term. If you don't take steps, you might be exposing your, your child's special needs trust to 10, 20, $30,000 in unnecessary property taxes in the future. That's all money that would have gone to support your child and now has to go to the state of California in the way of property taxes if you don't take steps ahead of time. So what can you do now? Um, I like to say you are the smart money now. You, know, you talk about the smart money is doing this. Smart investors are doing that. You are the smart money. You know what, what the smart people are doing. You, you have these, uh, these tools at your disposal. Um, take action. While this, your attention is on this, take action. Whether it's with our firm or with somebody else, that's fine. But I, I want you to take action. Let your friends know Prop 19 is a big deal. So few people are really aware of this. You guys are. Set your appointment with, with our team if you'd like. It would be a pleasure to serve you. Uh, we can review your existing plan. and We can go through these critical Prop 19 issues before the February deadline if you set it soon. And then over time, you just got to keep an eye on this because laws change. Situations change. And you have to stay on top of it. So that's how you stay on top of this. But you know, the key thing is, set a meeting soon. Um, and why us? You know, I talked to, I don't want to talk too much about our firm, but this is what we do. And, and again, as being part of the PACE community, it's always a pleasure and a privilege to serve people who are part of this, this wonderful community. This is what we do. Our firm focuses on trust and tax planning and special needs planning. We usually put on a big seminar. It used to be in person and we'd have a couple hundred people at this wonderful event every year talking about nothing but special needs trust and special needs planning. We had nonprofits there. I'm hopeful that next year, or at least the year after that, we'll be able to do that again in person. But special needs planning is big for what we do. Um, and, and our goal is to deliver value to you. So uh, before I get to some questions, uh, if you would like to work with us, I would. you can contact us. You can email ashley at gilfix.com at the bottom. If you'd like, you can enter your name and contact information in the Q&A function, and we'll reach out to you tomorrow um, to see about setting a meeting. We are very booked right now, but we do have some availability if you if you said it soon and we could work with you before the deadline. Um, it's been a crazy time in our office because these are such crazy times. Uh, these issues are are big. So it's a pleasure to work to to present to everyone here. But if you'd like, um, if you're watching this as a, as a recording, then obviously the Q&A function won't be there, but you can still call us and you can email Ashley and we can set something up. But please don't hesitate. If we can be of service to you, please let us know. And, and we're here to serve. You can contact us, to contact us anytime. So, wow, I went through so much stuff. Um, <laughs> Prop 19, Prop 19, Prop 19. That is the, the critical issue of the day. So on that note, I'm going to take, I'm going to take a couple questions. All right. I meant to stop sharing my screen. Um, I'm going to take a couple questions. And we'll go through um, what, whatever is on your mind. So let me go through one question from Kurt. Hey, good to see you, Kurt. Um, will a family protection trust be independent or will it require that I restructure my existing trust? So a family, that's a good question. This also relates to special needs trust. A family protection trust, the way that we set this up is a separate standalone trust. So you have your living trust, mom and dad have their trust. And they say, when I pass away, I am leaving money to a special needs trust for my son or my daughter. That is a separate freestanding document. Um, so if you create one, the change you'd make in your living trust, among other things, would just be to make sure that you're no longer leaving money directly to a child, but instead you're leaving it to the family protection trust for their benefit. Um, so it is an update to your living trust. And we've seen some approaches where, uh, we've seen trusts where they embed a form of a living trust, uh, sorry, of a family protection trust in mom and dad's living trust. So it says, when we pass away, this trust is created. Here are the terms of this trust and money flows into that. Um, our firm doesn't do it that way. 
Uh, we don't think that's a good approach for either family protection trust. We also see this for special needs trusts, where sometimes we've seen mom and dad's trust where it says, when we pass away, our money, our, our living trust creates a special needs trust. And here are the terms of it, and we'll go to that. We strongly, strongly recommend that you do separate fits, separate standalone family protection trust. And, and for special needs trust, that should be a separate standalone trust as well. Now, why would you do that? Um, one, if it's embedded in your trust and you need to update or restructure your trust, if tax laws change, well, you need to update the embedded trust in it as well. So every time you touch your trust and update it, if you want to revamp it, you have to make sure that you somehow include all this subtrust language. What if that, if you want to change the terms of that subtrust, it gets really complicated really fast. Um, so far cleaner to have a separate trust that you can update independently of your living trust. Also for special needs planning, and, and this is why it's so critical, this is a, a different question, but why it's so critical to have a separate standalone special needs trust rather than one embedded in your living trust, um, it has to go to county eligibility workers. So if your child's ever applying for SSI or MedCal, the state has a right to see a copy of that trust. If it's embedded in your living trust, just logistically, it's far more likely they're gonna get confused and say, ah, this isn't valid. It's, it's too many weird terms here. If it's a separate, clean, special needs trust, it's just easier for them to review and more likely they're going to accept it. Um, additionally, for asset protection planning, Prop 19 planning, a lot of this involves making transfers to trusts for your kids' benefit while you're still alive. If these trusts don't exist as separate standalone documents or entities, there's nothing to transfer assets to. You know, if, there's, if they only are come into existence when you pass away, there's nothing to transfer assets to while you're alive. And there are a lot of um, situations where we need to make transfers while you're alive. Prop 19 might be one of them to protect property tax increases. So a uh, really good question. Um, and you know, always good to, to connect with people from the PACE community. Um, uh, one other question is how we do things as a firm. Um, so some it, on rare occasions, we're able to offer some consultations right uh, for at no cost right now we are slammed um, so we're really limiting it to planning meetings so if you wanted to set a meeting with me or one of our attorneys you know contact our office gilfix.com is our information um, and you set a planning meeting we bill hourly for those initial meetings um, usually hour hour and a half is enough to really dive into these issues and then depending on what you do we we typically give flat fees for moving forward with a full plan um, but you know we want to provide value from the first moment we're talking to you I would love to offer some free consultations to people, but right now um, we're, we're just, there's a lot going on with Prop 19. So we wanna serve anybody who really wants to dive into this, we're here as a resource. Um, another question goes to, uh, what if I can't take action for Prop 19 before February 15th? What happens, you know, what, what happens then? Am I, am I screwed? Um, taking action before February 15th is, it provides, better options for planning. But if you miss that, you know, we hope you take action or at least get educated to decide if you should. You know, we want you to make an educated decision either way. After February 15th, there will still be planning opportunities, but they're going to be more challenging. We already have some ideas about what we can do for the, for the people who didn't pay attention to this until too late. There are going to be planning options, but they're going to be more expensive and they're going to be more cumbersome. Um, so it's going to get harder. But again, um, I have to wrap up in a second. But let me, let me just actually jump to a closing message. If you have a child on the autism spectrum and you want your house or other properties to be available to them, either as a place to live or to support them with rental income over the long term, you need to be aware of this issue. February 15th is a deadline. There's no one right size fits all solution, but there are a few different solutions we've developed. So again, we're a resource to you. Um, or if you have a team you're working with, ask them about this, see what they're offering as solutions, but do something. Maybe you end up not doing anything, but do it based on, on being educated and understanding what the trade-offs are rather than just not taking action. So uh, on that note, I want to thank everybody for being here again. Thank, thanks to Kurt and the, the PACE team. You guys are awesome. Um, it's a privilege and a, and a pleasure to be on the board for PACE and to be involved with this fantastic organization. I know it's facing its own challenges as we navigate this COVID craziness. Um, but please take some action, take a fresh look at your plan, and make sure that your child and your children are well protected over the long term. In these crazy, crazy times, there's so much out of our control. So let's take what we can control, and let's do whatever we can to protect what we work so hard for, for our family. So on that note, um, I hope everybody has a wonderful evening. I hope you're staying safe, 
sane and healthy. And I, I hope to stay involved and, and to speak with you all again soon. So thank you so much.